My guest today is writer, editor, and game designer, Matt Click. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the show where we learn how to become better game masters and better role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. You can find free RPG resources at DiceGeeks.com. Today's episode is a fantastic conversation with a game designer and an experienced game master and we'll get on with the show. My guest today is a writer, editor, and game designer whose credits include Wizards of the Coast, Fantasy Flight Games, and others. He is also a founding member of Absolute Tabletop, an independent tabletop RPG publishing company. Uh, Matt Click, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. Let's just start off really basically. When were you introduced to tabletop role-playing games? So uh, I was initially introduced uh, by my dad when I was probably about 10 or 11 years old. Uh, And the way he got me into it was uh, we started with Star Wars. Um, We started with the West End Games uh, version of the Star Wars RPG, um, which, uh, you know, at the time I was young enough where the concept of a role-playing game wasn't even really... Like, I didn't even really realize what we were doing as we were doing it until Mm -hmm. later when I looked back and I had been playing Dungeons and Dragons and stuff. And I realized like, oh, I actually started with Star Wars. I just, I didn't really think of it uh, in that way. So that's what we got me started was basically like, hey, how would you like to pretend to be Han Solo, uh, you know, for (laughs) a little while? And of course, that was very enticing. So, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we played a few sessions of that. And I was young enough where it was, you know, I couldn't sit for three or four hours and play. Um, And so we just sort of played sporadically. Um, But then, you know, around when I was 12, 13 years old, uh, the third edition of Dungeons and Dragons came out. And uh, we went out to the Wizards of the Coast storefront because they used to have storefronts out here on the West Coast. Um, We went out to the Wizards of the Coast storefront, picked up a starter set, uh, a couple sets of dice, went back home. And me and my dad and my younger sister all played uh, a couple sessions of D&D. And it's been sort of a constant in my life ever since then. So. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I I played a lot of uh, West End's uh, Star Wars system. Yeah, same. And it's it's a system that I find myself coming back to um, again and again. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people out there sort of keeping that legacy alive. There's a ton of resources online for it. There's Mm -hmm. the revised, expanded, updated edition. Um, I, I actually just sort of released my version of it. It's called Hyperspace D6, which is basically just the version that I've been running for the last few years. Um, it's just, it's a lot of fun. It's such a flexible system to, to hack and play around with. It's, it's sort of like a game designer's dream, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, uh, yeah. Released a campaign setting in the open D six system, which is basically the same thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I always found too, that it was, um, it was so much easier to get people to play the, the, the D six system, the West end game, because, uh, you know, you could make a character really fast. And, oh yeah. Yep. And like, I have all the, the rules basically memorized yep. and, <laughs> you know, and it was just like, um, that was an easier sell for some people than saying, Hey, let's play, uh, you know, uh, second edition Dungeon and Dragons, which might take eight hours to make a character or something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's so, it's so quick playing. And even if you, uh, have never played a role playing game before. It's fairly easy to pick up. Um, mm-hmm. the character sheet's super simple. The fact that you only have to worry about one kind of polyhedral as opposed to you know eight or nine of them <laughs> is definitely a huge selling point as well. So, yeah, yeah, it was a great uh, gateway for a lot of my friends, and uh, I'm glad to say they moved on to other games and are still playing uh, many other games. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Yeah, now. You know, I didn't mention this, but a number of years ago, I guess it was about 2013 or so, mm-hmm. I started watching some of your videos that you were posting on YouTube. And, oh. and you were kind of an inspiration to me to kind of even start what, I'm, what I do now because uh, it was kind of interesting because, uh, you know, I was 
kind of just out on YouTube one day searching for things. And I was like, I wonder if other people play role-playing games and do things with role-playing <laughs> games. And, uh, you know, I came across some of your videos and it was just, uh, uh, you know, just kind of inspiring to see you talking about role-playing games, uh, theory behind role-playing games. What led you to start posting? Oh, man. Well, first off, thank you. That's I had no idea. That's super awesome that I in any way inspired you to do this. But um, yeah, this, so this was back in 2011, 2012, around there. Um, and I I hesitate to call myself one of the original RPG YouTubers because there were plenty of people doing it at the time. Sure. Um, but I sort of came in uh, sort of at the tail end of one era and at the beginning of another where there were a lot of guys um, back then. There was Matthew Dawkins, who is now a uh, professional game designer working mm -hmm. with uh, Onyx Path on, you know, Vampire and Werewolf and things like that. Yeah. Uh, there was Dungeon Master Johnny. There was Tower Guard DM, uh, Samwise 7 RPG, you know, all of these guys that were all sort of this very close-knit community that were making videos not only for others, but back and forth with each other. There was this kind of communication that was happening with all of these people. Um, and I really wanted to, I really wanted to have an outlet for uh, my, my chief passion, which was running role-playing games. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I came up with, I, I had a column, a newspaper column that I wrote in college called A Fistful of Dice. And I decided I'm, I'm going to bring that over into a video format. And I'm just going to like, you know, talk about RPGs and tell stories and stuff like that. So I started doing that. And then uh, about a year into making videos, uh, people started running games online. And this was before, like now, any given time you can log on to Twitch and there will be two or three groups of people playing D&D &D mm -hmm. on Twitch. And there's, you know, Critical Role and Acquisitions Incorporated. There are all these huge games with, with big names attached to them. But at the time, playing D and D online, not only playing online, but, but uh, broadcasting it so people could tune in and watch was kind of a weird alien concept. Mm -hmm. Um, but I loved it. I, I, I loved the idea that, uh, you know, people could tune in and, and watch a D and D game and see how different groups do things. Um, you know, the balance of role play to mechanics, uh, how different DMs sort of run the game and create atmosphere and tone. And it was a unique challenge in that, you really, you had to uh, navigate around some of the limitations of the technology of playing online with people that it presented this unique challenge that I really enjoyed sort of uh, adapting my style to, which was, you know, primarily running games at the table. So I started running games on my YouTube channel, uh, and that was... Uh, that was really exciting because at the time there wasn't a, a deluge of content. And so I actually, you know, I would get quite a few viewers and there were a few times where I would run a game and there would be, you know, a hundred people watching. And that was just, that was amazing. Now that, that number seems paltry compared to, you know, some of the, what the bigger streams pull in, but at the time it was really cool and it felt really neat. And so, uh, that sort of inspired me to keep going and, um, really that's how I kind of stumbled into game design as well is that people started asking for the things that I was using in my games, the monsters that I was creating, the campaigns I was running. They wanted to know more about the settings and the systems and things like that. And so that's, you know, inadvertently sort of bumbled my way into being a semi-professional game designer <laughs> was running games on YouTube. So I really got into uh, bleak wrath Okay, uh, yeah. Could you tell uh, the listeners about Bleak Wrath? Yeah, so um, when I first started running games, there was a, I ran this campaign that was called The Provokers that was intended as a one-shot um, and then became a campaign uh, because we were all just having too much fun. And uh, we played, I think it was 18 or 19 sessions over the course of a couple of years, uh, playing usually about once a month um, with some breaks here and there. Um, and uh, we, you know, all of the players in that game, uh, myself and Michael Barker, uh, Tim Carney, Nate Vanderzee, uh, Lee Patterson, otherwise known as Juice, uh, we all ended up eventually sort of meeting in person and stuff and really became great friends. And as the campaign was ending, uh, we decided that we wanted to do another one. Um, 
And so uh, we took about a three or four month break and then started a campaign called Provokers Bleak Wrath, which is uh, it's a, a new player. We have uh, Mike uh, Lasham, otherwise known as Mike the Piper. He's uh, uh, our fourth player. And it's set in the same setting, uh, but 20 years later. And it's really fun because I can I can look back at that first campaign and see, you know, the actions and decisions that were made by the players. And then, you know, fast forward 20 years, and now these new characters have to contend with kind of the conflicts and problems that have been created as a result of the decisions that their previous characters made. Um, so that's been really fun. And that's a that's a game that I I wish I had more time to run and I wish that our schedules aligned a little bit better. You know, at this point it's it's uh it's exciting if we if we manage to get a game in once a month. Um and man, ever since I had my daughter was born last year and then moving and stuff, it's just been it's been so hard to nail down dates, but um we're actually hoping to get another date on the calendar here soon. So um but man, that's a lot of fun. It is, uh, it's just the best group of guys to play with. And, um, I, I really couldn't ask for better players in that game. Okay. Um, could you just tell, uh, uh just a little bit about the setting? Yeah. So the setting itself, it's, uh, this place called Aranoth, which is sort of my generic fantasy, uh, setting, uh, that I created years and years ago to run games in. And it was the setting of the first Provokers campaign. And, uh, you know, now it's where Bleak Wrath is set. But it's basically a, uh, it's these two continents, uh, a northern one and a southern one. And, uh, you know, all your basic fantasy races are there. But the, the main thing is that uh, about 2,000 years ago in the setting, there was this event called the Great Scorching, where this uh, this great human empire that had sort of risen up and 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 conquered essentially everything uh and you know they were using necromantic magic and sort of forbidden ancient uh sorcery in order to hold on to their power um they were rebelled against uh by the rest of aranoth and uh, as a result the leader of this empire decided to open up this portal into a dimension known as the bleak which is where all of the dragons had been imprisoned by the gods. And uh, he basically unleashed all of the dragons into the world and they just scorched it. Uh, there's this event called the great scorching. Uh, the world was completely reshaped and changed. Uh, it was this massive blasted desert in the middle of the world called Sonagais that was left as a result, just this black glassy sand that was all melted. Um, and 2000 years later, the, the echoes of that are still felt and, in Bleak Wrath, the reason why it's called Bleak Wrath specifically is because uh, the actions of the provokers in the first campaign uh, sort of bled this dimension called the Bleak back into the world. And it's sort of the source of where the magic comes from, but it's also a dimension, a plane in and of itself where things live and uh, time is weird inside there. And it's just sort of an anything goes sort of situation. And so this, this, chaotic magic is sort of leaking into the world and the campaign involves these characters sort of journeying around to different places in Aranoth and uh, sealing up these holes where the bleak is leaking in. Um, and they've actually gone into the bleak uh, and interacted with a character there who was from the previous campaign who had been trapped there. Um, and uh, so they're, they're much more, they're interacting with like the primal magic of Aranoth, the, the like, the creative sort of magic, the, the magic that, that created this world and that is sort of intrinsically linked to all living things. Uh, they're interacting with it like in a very uh, like tangible way in this second campaign, which is a lot of fun because I can get really weird with it. So, <laughs> No, that's great. Um, now, I was just at a convention over the weekend and I was on some panels and there's a lot of questions. Um, everybody always asks, how do you prepare for a session or a campaign? Yeah, that's, uh, that is like the question. And that's what anytime you meet a game master, that's sort of what you want to know. And especially a game master that you've seen run games before you want to know, like, Hey, you know, how much prep do they do? Like, I'm always very interested, like when, you know, Chris Perkins or Matt Mercer or somebody like that, like posts a picture of their prep, like that's like, Oh man, hook it to my veins. Like I, I you know, I want to <laughs> see what, what they do and how they do it. Not necessarily so that I can copy it, but just because I find that so interesting because everyone does it in such a different way. Um, so for me, uh, I, you know, my, my prep style has changed a lot over the years. And honestly, like it, 
it sort of changes with every session because I feel like, you know, every session, every campaign, you know, depending on the system, depending on the setting, you know, you might go into it needing different things. Um, but typically what I'll do is I'll, I'll prepare a single page. I like to keep it to a single page because uh, if I find myself having to shuffle through papers, uh, then I, you know, I, I've already lost time and I already feel unfocused and it's, it's, the notes are no longer helpful if I'm having to shuffle through them. So I keep it to a single page. Um, I love bullet points so that I can easily find what I need. And typically what I'll have is I'll have a list of possible scenes that I think might happen, uh, complete with some, some sort of sensory details that I can sprinkle in throughout. Um, a short list of uh, the important NPCs that they might be interacting with. Um, I also include uh, a brief recap of the previous session so that I can kind of lead into uh, the current session with what happened last time. This is especially useful if you're like me, where games might happen a month or two apart from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I do what are called incidentals, which incidentals are... It's like, uh, you know, when you're running a game and you get to a point in the game where there's like a lull and you feel like, oh, there's a there's a blank spot here. We're in, we're in we're in between the lines of my prep notes right now, and I'm not exactly sure what to do here. We're between locations or between scenes or they've gone in a direction I didn't anticipate. Incidentals are little things that you can throw in. So it might be a minor encounter, uh, an NPC that they run into and have to interact with, um, a strange uh, location or scene that they come upon, you know, it could be, you know, if you're running a game in a jungle and you have these scenes set up, but then, you know, in between traveling between locations, between scenes, you decide that you're going to throw in this, uh, this ruin to some sort of God that you threw in, in the incidentals. And it might not be pertinent to the greater story that you're trying to tell, but it's something that you can throw in where, uh, it's something for the players to interact with. It's something to, uh, make the world seem a little bit more real and tangible. Uh, and it's a good excuse to throw in ideas that are not necessarily fully fleshed out or that you don't necessarily have a place for specifically. So uh, that's for me, like scenes, NPCs, incidentals, those are the big things. Um, and that's typically what I, what I will prep for, you know, any sort of like standard D and D game or anything like that. Uh, if I'm running something that's a little bit more like lore heavy, like I recently ran a, a legend of the five rings campaign, uh, using mm -hmm. the new fantasy flight game system mm -hmm. that my, my prep was much more involved because I wanted to make sure that I had everything in order to get the setting across where there's like this very specific tone with like the culture and the way things work. Um, and so that was a little bit more like, uh, you know, a one note file with different folders and things that I could easily navigate to if I needed to, depending on what was going on. So, uh, but yeah, typically a single page, keep it simple, keep it light. I know just for me, right, uh, you know, when you have jobs and families mm -hmm. and things like this, it's just, um, how do you, how do you get the time to do that prep? Uh, late at night is mostly <laughs> like, that's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, uh, I've always been a bit of a night owl and, uh, I find that my most creative time is like between 10 and, you know, two in the morning. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, having a kid has only, <laughs> it's, it's only encouraged me to be worse about it. Um, <laughs> where that's kind of my most creative time. And if I have a game coming up, um, I'll usually be prepping the night before. Um, but I, I think a lot of my prep and a lot of, honestly, a lot of my creative work in general, it happens, it happens throughout the week. You know, it happens when I'm in the shower or, you know, cleaning my house or eating lunch or something, you know, it'll just, I'll have these ideas and, you know, I always have a notepad handy or my phone or whatever, and I'll just jot notes down and um, it sort of happens in bits and pieces. And so, uh, especially in recent years, my prep has become less of a, I'm going to sit down for an hour and a half and prep for my game and more, all right, I'm going to sit down for 20 minutes and compile all of these like napkin notes that I have from the week, you know, and make sure that they all make sense and all work together and sort of bind them together with some sort of glue if I can. Uh, so that's, <laughs> that's the main thing is like, I prep when I can is, is the, is the best answer I can give you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, um, well, I just recently published a book called the no prep game master. So yeah. uh, I, I kind of go for that route. Um, yeah. That, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, you know, <laughs> As I said, I was at a convention over the weekend, and and a lot of people have a lot of opinions about this. But right. some of my thoughts are, 
if a player can show up to a game with a character sheet and they haven't done anything during the week, why do I have to do something during the week? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really, it's a good point. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I mean, the thing is, is that at a certain point, uh, if you're playing with the same group, if you're playing with the same characters, if you're running in the same setting, mm-hmm. campaigns tend to go on autopilot. You, ha- you, know, you go into a game kind of knowing what direction the players are going to go and what they're, story- what they're going to encounter. And um, I mean, b- preparing to improv, I mean, that's the, the best skill you can have, right? It's just having the tools at your disposal so that you can go into a game with as little prep as possible. I think that's... You know, that's definitely the style that I err towards as well. Um, you know, I'm on the spectrum of prep on one end is no prep and on the other end is like, you know, pages and pages of prep. I'm definitely yeah. pretty far left of center. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, also, another question that kept came in, you know, coming up is uh, how do you handle situations when, you know, say you're describing the characters in a dungeon room or something and you just describe the room really quickly offhand and maybe you don't even know why you do it, but you just say, okay, there's something over here, something over here. And there's like a rock in the corner or something. How do you handle then when the players start saying, you know, what kind of rock is it? How big is it? Can I pick it up? Can I make an ax out of it? You know, different things like that. How do you handle stuff like that? Honestly, that that's kind of my, I feel like that's sort of where the magic of role-playing games happens is when things like that occur when, you know, some sort of like throwaway detail that you didn't think twice about, but that the players completely fixate on. Mm -hmm. That's like where the collaborative narrative happens, right? Where, Mm -hmm. you know, in the mind, the collective sort of uh, uh, mental image of the table, that rock is really important. And it's sort of, you know, before they go and investigate it, <clears throat> excuse me, they, you know, it's sort of this vague thing, but then they go and look at it and it becomes more solid in your mind. And as they're picking it up and investigating this seemingly mundane rock, you know, all of a sudden the DM is describing, yeah, there's this weird like silver ore that's sort of veining this rock. It's, it's very strange looking. And as you pick it up, it, it's lighter than it should be, you know? And all of a sudden the DM is just like bull their way into this like heavy piece of lore that is just being created ad hoc at the table just because they need it at that time at that moment Mm -hmm. and i love that i love throwing throwing details at the you know into the center of the table that i have no idea what they mean what they pertain to if they're important or not like part of being a dm is throwing uh, casting a wide net and seeing, you know, what the players decide to sort of latch onto. Um, so I would say, you know, when, when that happens, when you throw out this random detail, like the rock in the dungeon or, you know, a dagger stuck in a butcher block or something like that, you're just putting it in a set dressing, but with the players fixate on it, if they're fixating on something, that means they're interested in it. It means they want to know more about it. And that to me is a, is an opportunity as a DM to, uh, inject a little bit of the world into that element um, and get creative with it. So I, uh, you know, I, I hate to say just, just go with whatever the players want to do um, because that seems like such s- simple advice, but really that's, that's sort of my, my thing is like go with what the players want to do because, you know, I can put them on the rails and guide them through a story that I wrote anytime I want. But like I said, that collaborative narration that occurs at the table, that, that narrative that exists only in the minds of the people playing the game, that's like the magic of, of RPGs. I guess another question that also came up is just that, um, say the uh, game master has prepared something mm-hmm. and they are really looking forward to getting to this scene or uh, this kind of conflict or whatever it is. But then uh, the players, while they're say, while they're, you know, going up the mountains to the, the mythical mine that's lost up there, they, they have a random encounter. Um, Maybe they find a burned wagon or something next to the road. Mm -hmm. Then all of the sudden they're trying to find out whose wagon it was and things like this. And they seem to have forgotten (laughs) about the kind of the main point of why they were heading up into the mountains. How do you, how would you handle something like that? 
That's always really tough, um, especially if you if you have something in mind or have something prepped that you're really excited to get to. Um, but I always tell people like, there's no reason why if it doesn't happen when you think it is that it's never going to happen. Like mm -hmm. you always have a chance to keep stuff like that in your back pocket and pull it out when you need it. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's also, uh, there's this, this technique, uh, <laughs> that's like the illusion of choice where mm -hmm. the players think that they're, you know, Oh, we're going to investigate this wagon. We're going to go off in this other direction but they still wind up where you kind of want them to go. And it might take a little bit of creative finagling as a DM to kind of make it that seamless sort of transition where they don't realize that they've, <laughs> they've gone off in another direction, but still wandered in the direction that you kind of want them to go. But, you know, as the DM, if you can kind of guide the players a little bit or just sort of put things in their path that you want them to encounter... Uh, ultimately, they won't feel as though they've been uh, railroaded or or had their hands held to go to this specific thing or interact with this specific thing because you've given them that illusion of choice. Um, and that might seem a little bit like uh, nefarious, like, <laughs> oh, it doesn't matter what we choose because the DM is going to take us wherever we want to go. But this is I'm speaking in specific instances of like something that kind of needs to happen in the mm -hmm. campaign, something that you've prepped, something that you want to have happen, something that you know the players will enjoy. There's no reason why you can't sort of, eh, like, you know, kind of guide them a little bit in that direction. Um, what are your thoughts on fudgy ro roles behind a DM screen or something like that? Man, I go back and forth on that a lot. <laughs> I think that... <laughs> I think, so do I, actually. <laughs> I, yeah, I, and I think the reason why I go back and forth on it is because... Uh, this is such a like cop out answer, but it depends. Yeah. Like it depends on the people that I'm playing with. If it's like a casual game with like family members and close friends, and we're just kind of BSing at the table and, and having fun sort of delving into dungeons and stuff like, you know, a fudge roll here and there is it's whatever it's everyone's just having fun. But if you're, you know, if you're in the climactic final combat of a years long campaign and life and death is on the line, then I like to have the dice kind of fall where they may. I like to have fate, you know, involved in that aspect because it is so important and vital and the dice really do matter. Um, so I would say it absolutely depends for me. I, I, <laughs> I definitely go back and forth on that, depending on the game, depending on the people. Yeah, yeah, so do I. I, I can't get a hard answer because sometimes it feels right and sometimes it feels wrong. So Yeah, well, and some people are really... Uh, some people are very passionate about the way they feel about that yeah, <laughs> one way or the yeah. other. Yes, I've I've been learning that. Yes. Um yeah. I've seen some, you know, discussions in forums and things where people are like, Well, the game master's cheating. Game yeah. master's cheating. And you're just, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh I don't know. The things we obsess about sometimes, but <laughs> Yeah, it's it's it seems uh you know, I I know a lot of people feel that it it kind of is uh well, why even play, you know, a game with dice if you're going to ignore the dice, you yeah. know, like you fudge every single roll that sure. comes up, but sure. you know, it's pretty rare that I'll roll the dice and the number will affect the outcome in a way that is, you know, campaign changing. So Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely. Now, um I mentioned at the beginning that you were a founder of Absolute Tabletop. Could you tell us a little about that? Yeah, so Absolute Tabletop, we're uh, an indie uh, RPG publisher. Um, we started in 2015, and uh, we started with uh, the four of us. Again, people that I had gamed with online, people that I had uh, forged friendships with and ended up meeting in person. Um, we decided to start this company, Absolute Tabletop, and... We started um, publishing uh, little kind of supplements here and there, um, little add-ons for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, uh, little pieces of our, of our worlds. Uh, one of the first things I published with Absolute Tabletop was a book about this famous tavern in the world of Aranoth. Um, but eventually we, uh, you know, we kind of got better at writing, we got better at editing, better at layout, started working with some really, really talented artists and... Um, kind of branched into crowdsourcing, doing things uh, on Kickstarter. Um, mm -hmm. And we've been doing bigger and bigger books, um, more and more involved things. Um, one of our really successful sort of product lines 
for lack of a better phrase, is are, are these things called adventure kits, um, mm-hmm. which are these sort of fully modular adventure modules um, where it's not a story that you follow along with. It's not a set adventure with this encounter happens and this encounter happens. It is a, a method, a, a toolbox by which you can piece together your own adventures using uh, encounters, locations, monsters, non-player characters, all of which kind of fit together in different ways, these different sort of puzzle pieces that uh, you can put together however you like. Um, and all of it is held together by multitudes of roll tables for things like loot and hazards and traps and, you know, twists and turns and things like that, adventure hooks. Um, the adventure kits have been really, really fun to write um, because they're sort of they mirror the way that we prep as game masters. And the phrase that we always say at absolute tabletop is we make what we use. Like if we're going to make a book, if we're going to spend the time to write and publish a, an RPG source book, we want it to be something that we would use at our tables. Um, And so the adventure kits represent sort of the, uh, the more improv heavy, the GM who can come to the table with very little prepped and still have a ton of awesome content to go on. Um, And so that's kind of what the adventure kits are. Um, Right now we're working on, uh, it's a book called A Dead Man's Guide to Dragon Grin. Uh, mm-hmm. And it is our first full campaign setting. It's going to be, you know, three, 400 pages, something, something like that. Um, and it is a, uh, it's a world where evil has won and heroes are not welcome. So mm-hmm. very dark fantasy. There's some magitech in there, some kind of cool, weird Lovecraftian uh, mm-hmm. things happening as well. And uh, That is a book that we uh, also crowdsourced on Kickstarter uh, and are feverishly working on uh, as we are currently a few months late on our uh, initial deadline. So, Okay. Um, Okay. Well, I mean, that sounds really interesting. Um, I I noticed, you know, well, I've seen, obviously I've seen some of your products. Um, Could you tell us a little bit about the uh, Mecha Hack? Yeah, so uh, Mecha Hack was a it's a game that I released uh, last year, and um, it is a it is a hack upon a hack. Uh, <laughs> I used a, a game called the Black Hack, which is an amazing um, little rules light D and D style uh, game by David Black, very talented game designer. Uh, and the Black Hack is just this really fun, um, like I said, rules light, but it's just very easy to kind of mess around with it and do different things with it. Um, And there are a lot of different uh, versions of the black hack out there. And what I did was I took the black hack and I created a game uh, for running mecha games. So if you're into Gundam, Robotech, you know, that kind of stuff, Transformers, anything Mm -hmm. with big giant robots beating the snot out of each other, (laughs) Pacific Rim, even uh, you can use the mecha hack to run a game really quickly and easily uh, using these rules. And so, this was sort of a game that uh, I pieced together over the course of a couple of months. Uh, it's what I call a cell phone game in that I I mostly wrote it, you know, just on my phone as I was sort of in between things, mm-hmm. <clears throat> in between tasks at work or, or, you know, whatever. I would just sort of jot down ideas and it sort of very quickly came together. So uh, a lot of awesome positive response for the mecha hack. There isn't really anything else out there for, for very quickly and easily running mecha games. Like typically mecha games are pretty complicated uh, for, for good reason. Cause there's a lot mm-hmm. of like moving bits and pieces. You have to account for a pilot and a mech and all this different kind of stuff. But uh, the mecha hack is like, if, if you want to run a mecha game and you have no prep, you've got no miniatures, a couple players didn't show up for your typical D&D game. The Mecha Hack is intended to be a game that you can pull out and run a game on the fly very easily uh, and, you know, create big Titanic war machines in just a couple minutes. So, yeah. What about uh, Drift Chapel? So Shadows Over Drift Chapel is our second adventure kit. One of those books I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, this was a book that I was sort of primary project lead on. And, uh, it is an adventure kit set in a seaside town called Drift Chapel, which is plagued by these strange, unnerving shadows that have sort of risen up from the deep. Uh, and it is it is my love letter to Cthulian horror. Uh, 
Lovecraftian horror is, is something I've always sort of been enamored with and mm-hmm. <clears throat> loved that sort of that tone, that sort of bleak tone, but also like these sort of dogged heroes sort of standing against the the overwhelming darkness. And so Shadows Over Drift Chapel is sort of my homage to that. Um, it's very like flintlock fantasy with deep ones coming up out of the water. There's an ancient sea goddess that is sort of pulling the strings behind the scenes. Um, and this was another book that we uh, we funded on Kickstarter and delivered last year. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, it's a book that I'm really, really happy with, really proud of. Um, lots of lots of awesome art in there uh, mm-hmm. by Alexander Kostic, John Pintar. Um, and it's a book that we... Uh, we kind of went the extra mile on, we had a stretch goal in the Kickstarter campaign for including a, uh, a, g- a gazetter of the entire world. Um, and we met that stretch goal. And so we were able to flesh out not only the city of Drip Chapel, <coughs> excuse me, but the entire world, this entire sort of crumbling near apocalyptic Flintlock fantasy world known as Gloam. We were able to completely flush it out with different regions and locations and adventure hooks. And so uh, it's a, it is a very fun book to read through to use um, just because it is so chock full of content that is just intended to sort of spark the imagination and, and uh, uh, you know, maybe even kick off a campaign or something like that. Mm-hmm. Now, is that uh, compatible with 5e or? Yes. Yeah, it is compatible with 5e. And in fact, there are, um, there are uh, flintlock rules, rules for using flintlock firearms oh. uh, that are compatible with 5th edition on our, and are a little bit grittier than, you know, the rules as, uh, as uh, provided in the Dungeon sure. Master's Guide. Because you do have flintlock weaponry in the Dungeon Master's Guide for 5th edition, but mm-hmm. I like, you know... <laughs> having to account for, uh Oh, it's raining. You know, I need to keep my powder dry, that sort of thing. And, oh, okay. uh, k- taking into account misfires and things like that. So there's some optional rules in there for the flintlock weapons, um, that are a little bit grittier, a little bit more, uh, realistic than, you know, typical, uh, D and D rules for flintlock weapons. Oh, that sounds great. Um, well, nowadays, since anybody can publish a book, do you have any advice for somebody who's considering publishing? Yeah, uh, I would say find other people to work with you. Um, game design is, by its nature, it's a very like lonely pursuit. Um, oftentimes, you're working by yourself on things for very long periods of time. And so if you can find other people who have different skill sets than you... Um, people who, you know, if you're a, if you're a really uh, productive writer, if you're efficient in the number of words that you can crank out, you know, on a daily basis, find someone who's really good at editing, find someone who's really good at trimming things down and making things cohesive and proofreading for grammar and syntax and things like that. Uh, If you're good with layout, find someone who is a talented artist uh, who can, you know, create awesome art that you can put in the book. Um, it's not something that I ever, uh, suggest people try to do alone. Um, I've tried it many, many times to do to it completely on my own. And, uh, since starting absolute tabletop and, and collaborating with other people on these books, I've, you know, written and produced more in the last four years than I have the rest of my life combined easily. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've published over a dozen RPG books and all of that is because I was able to lean on other people and I I was held accountable by other people. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to miss a deadline if the only person counting on that deadline is yourself. But if you have other people relying on you to create something, then it's a lot easier to motivate yourself at, you know, 11 or midnight to just crank it out and get it done. So, uh, find other people that you that you admire uh, that you want to collaborate with and reach out to them and and try to get something going. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes, yeah. <laughs> seeing as how I do most of my stuff by myself. That's yeah, well, and it's 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 lonely though. You know, it it is. Yeah. You know, and it's it's nice to have other people that you can bounce even just bouncing ideas off of. You know, if. Mm-hmm. If, uh, if you're able to, you know, chat with other people, other creators and just say, Hey, here's this idea I had. What do you guys think? Um, that's so helpful to have that, that sounding board. Um, Mm -hmm. so it's for me, 
you know, I tried for many years to do this thing alone and it just, it did not work for me. My, my, my work style just, it didn't, <laughs> I had zero productivity, <laughs> sure. uh, but something about the, uh, the, <laughs> the guilt of letting other people <laughs> down. There's some, my, I think it really works for me for some reason. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. And that's, uh, that's understandable. And certainly, I mean, I say I do my stuff alone. Of course, my, my wife is a very good editor and she is very creative, even though, uh, her experience with tabletop role playing games is a lot uh, less than, than I have, but she is very creative. So, uh, right. in some sense there, you know, I am working with her on those things. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's all you need really is somebody who's there as a support, somebody who's able to do some things that you can't do. And Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons why Absolute Tabletop has been relatively successful is because the four of us all have very different skill sets. And, you know, I am an editor by trade. And so I, you know, I'm editing everything that we do. Um, Barker is an incre- has an incredible mind for money. He handles all of our finances and makes sure that we don't, you know, accidentally go broke while we're trying to produce these books. <laughs> uh, helpful. Yeah, it's very helpful. Very <laughs> helpful. Uh, Tim Carney is a incredibly talented uh, art director. He's really good at fostering relationship with with artists, working with them to, uh, you know, revise art and make it exactly the way that we want to be. And then James uh, handles all of our web stuff. He set up our store, um, make sure that our server stays up, that you know we have an email list that we're able to communicate with, uh, that our pledge manager works for getting you know information out to Kickstarter backers and things like that. So it's all of these things that if I attempted to do on my own would be it would be com- it would be a full time job times three. It would be mm-hmm. completely overwhelming. And so having those different skill sets all come together, it is very much, you know, by our powers combined sort of <laughs> situation. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, now you've mentioned Kickstarter a couple of times. What, what has the experience been like using Kickstarter? Kickstarter is, man, it's a really neat thing to be able to um, offset some of the costs of creating something like an RPG book. Mm-hmm. Um, art alone is, it's an incredible investment. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think people realize that if you're paying artists what they're worth, which you should yeah. be, mm-hmm. um, that it is really expensive to fill a book with art. If you're mm-hmm. making a 50, 60, 70 page book, let alone a 300 or 400 page RPG book, the art that you're going to need to fill up that book is going to be an incredible investment. And so for us, that is the main boon of Kickstarter um, is being able to offset some of that cost up front um, where people are able to support you and you are able to take some of those funds and say, okay, cool. Now I can fund art for this book or I can fund a, a, uh, you know, a full print run of this book. We don't have to just do print on demand. We can print a whole palette of these books and bring them in or whatever, which is a lot cheaper. Um, but the main thing for us, I think, has been reaching new people. Um, one thing that Kickstarter allows that I don't think any other platform really does um, in terms of crowdfunding is just the the number of new people that you reach because people are always searching Kickstarter for new things, new exciting things, things that look cool, things that appeal to them. And mm-hmm. there are many, I would say, many hundreds, if not thousands of people who are now quote unquote fans of absolute tabletop who stumbled upon us randomly on Kickstarter, not even through an ad, not through us linking, not through us sending out newsletters, but literally just browsing Kickstarter and finding us. And that's something that you can see sort of in the, you know, the metrics that you get through Kickstarter, you know, how many people, you know, found it just through browsing Kickstarter. And it's a lot, it's a staggering amount. Hmm. So for us, it's being able to offset some of the cost of art, um, you know, and other expenses as well, but also reaching that, that new audience Mm -hmm. as well. Those new people who otherwise would have no idea who absolute tabletop was, they see, you know, Oh, shadows over drift chapel. That looks cool. Let me go check out what these guys, what other, what else they've done, you know? Um, that's, I mean, that's invaluable to us as Mm -hmm. a small publisher. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, where can people, uh, find you and, and learn more? 
Um, so if you're interested in checking out what Absolute Tabletop publishes, you can go to absolutetabletop.com. Um, but we also have all of our stuff available on Drive Through RPG if that's more your speed. Um, we do PDFs and print on demand through Drive Through RPG as well. So you just search for Absolute Tabletop on Drive Through RPG. You can find us there. Or again, like I said, absolutetabletop.com. Okay, and I will be sure to add links to all of those and, cl- and to your uh, YouTube channel and that in the show notes for this episode. Um, so I would just like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. This was uh, awesome to just sit and chat with you, man. Okay, well, there you have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Matt. As I mentioned, I have linked up all of his RPG products and adventure kits in the show notes for this episode, which you can find at dicegeeks.com. If you want some free stuff, head over to dicegeeks.com slash free. You will get 10 free dungeon maps plus some other RPG PDFs that you can use in your campaigns. Also, if you enjoy this show, please consider heading over to patreon.com slash dicegeeks. Any support on Patreon is greatly appreciated and just lets me know that you want me to keep making this show. Thank you for listening, and until next time, keep gaming.